Ladies and gentlemen, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is, this is a video where I will cover multiple chess games in a match played between Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura, which is definitely our favorite matchup. The bad news is, unlike some previous encounters which go down to the wire, have me screaming for 35 minutes in a recap and end in a one game margin, today we are going to be in awe of how Magnus Carlsen played. This one was slightly less close than some of their other matches, but it was still a titanic back and forth struggle. They played some unbelievable high level chess, but today Magnus came to play. And Magnus came to prove a point to such an extent that in his post match interview, he said something crazy, which I will tell you after I show you these games. Three games. This is a best of four. So they're playing four rapid games, 15 minute chess against each other. Uh, if you win two and a half out of three, then you don't need to play a fourth game. That's how they, that's how it works. They're playing in an online event known as the AI Cup. Fitting name for a chess tournament in 2023. You throw AI on anything, the valuation of it goes up by 25%. Um, Magnus begins game number one with the move knight to f3. And make no mistake, Hikaru has been the closest rival to Magnus Carlsen over the last three years. I mean, mostly they play blitz and rapid, but even so, uh, and, and, and a lot of that has been online, but even so, that is the reality. So the match begins with a ready. Magnus plays c4, so now we are in an English opening. This is c4, knight f6, knight f3. Black has many choices, but this particular move order stops Black from playing the mainline English, reverse Sicilian. So kind of a, a nice little move order idea there. Hikaru plays b6, looking to play a Queen's Indian. He has been playing a lot of Queen's Indians against Magnus recently. G3, and I think just in general, E6 castles, and you will notice that white has delayed the move D4. The move D4 would turn this completely into a Queen's Indian. But because Magnus hasn't played it, he's just developing in a way where he doesn't actually move the pawn to D4. Now, I'm very confused why Hikaru's clock says 10 seconds. Why, why does Hikaru's clock say 10 seconds? That's very weird. I'm going to refresh now. And we are going to go back. And that's not really much of a spoiler because this entire video is hyping up Magnus anyway. That was very weird. All right, Hikaru's time is normal again. If you're surprised by the result of the game, well, I, I, I just, I mean, generally from the thumbnail and the title, you, it's mostly gonna be to see how Magnus defeats his biggest rival multiple times. So Magnus plays this in a way where the move d4 gets delayed a lot. So Hikaru plays d5. Magnus trades his flank pawn for a center pawn, which is a nice trade. Hikaru takes with the knight so as to keep the lines open. Potentially the queen and potentially the bishop. Now Magnus plays e4, take, take. And now and only now is he ready with the move d4. So Magnus has played this in a very interesting way where he's going to try to get a very big center. He's going to try to have two pawns versus one. Then he might play the move d5 in the future. He'll put his bishop out there or to that diagonal if it's possible. He'll put his rook on c1. Let's see what happens. Um, Hikaru takes and plays knight c6. And just visually, it looks like black is doing a very comfortable job of fighting back. The knight is out here. The queen has eyes on the center. The bishop has eyes on the center. The knight's got eyes right here. Everything is good. So how is Magnus going to defeat his biggest rival in this format of the last few years, who frequently gets wins off of him, can beat him in a match? How does Magnus outplay arguably the second best chess player in the world right now. How does that work? Let's watch. Putting his rook on the C file. This move is not complicated. I literally just said that move. If I know that that's one of the best moves, Magnus definitely knows. Hikaru plays rook C8. So they're both fighting for equity on the D file. C file rather. Queen D3. The queen slides out. The idea of this move is twofold. You'd like to take back with a rook so that your rook is there. You also want to prevent anything from getting onto this diagonal. Hikaru now plays queen d7, trying to keep the tension. But what Hikaru apparently should have done is taken, which seems like you wouldn't want to do that because you'd give up the file, but the computer is totally unafraid and just likes the pressure. And if white tries to play a move like e5, you just go back, and this one pawn move cannot be taken back. You can't bring the pawn backwards, and actually black gets really good control of the light squares, apparently. 
All right, I don't make the moves, I just relay them to you. Hikaru tries to keep the tension. Magnus's other key idea in the position is to move the pawn into the center. If that move becomes possible in the Queen's Indian structures, white is going to get a big advantage. Why does this move look impossible? Because black has three things covering it, right? Black's entire position is set up to prevent that move, and suddenly it's possible. It's possible because of tactics. Rook is going to the bishop. So at the end of the big clearance, the rook is going to see the bishop. Black can't really take their eyes off the bishop. So Hikaru plays rook c1. And now something weird happens, because rather than taking with the bishop here, which you would think would serve a purpose to counter, no. Instead of that, Magnus takes with the rook. And now we see the idea in full effect. It has nothing to do with the pawn. It's, it's not, nothing to do with the bishop. It's not take, take. I mean, if you, you go down this line, black's just pawn up, and Magnus is not going to be happy here. The idea of that move was to bring in the knight. Now you come in with the tempo on the queen, the queen moves, and e takes d5 with the idea of playing pawn to d6. Now Magnus has made some progress in the position. So he's gotten here, but he's lost a pawn. The way Hikaru has done this is he's got five, and Magnus only has four, but the quality of that one is really damn good. Not only does Magnus have the potential to push it, he's completely restricting this knight from any activity, and this bishop, also the open lines and the space advantage, contribute to attacking possibilities. Magnus plays the best move, queen c3, setting up potential checkmating opportunities over here, and infiltration points with the queen in the future. Also, the queen could be trapped. Sometimes. Not right now, but I'm just saying. That's all ideas. Bishop f6, rook a1, forces the queen, and despite being a pawn down, Magnus trades the queens and gets in with his rook, and now we really see the problem. That bishop is sealed off from society and is now being targeted. The knight comes back, Magnus improves his position yet again. He's building upon his positional advantage. He now has all the benefits of his position. Mine is being a pawn down. Hikaru trades the rooks. It's a minor piece uh, endgame. D pawn versus B pawn. This pawn is of a much higher quality. Here come the kings. Bishop a3, bishop e7. Magnus poking, trying to weaken the black position. Knight c6, now it's bishops versus bishop knight. The pawn is two squares away from queening, but it's very, very closely being monitored, and it's a time scramble. Can the best endgame player of all time beat arguably one of the best defensive players of the modern generation? I mean, you're probably looking at two of them right now, but Hikaru is ridiculous at defending these positions. He will do it against everybody in the world. But will he do it against Magnus Carlsen? Knight a6, looking for a knight versus bishop endgame. Magnus mobilizing. Pushing his pawn forward to restrict black's airspace. Hikaru, in this position, makes a very big decision. He plays g6. The risk of that move is after h6, both these pawns are targets for that light squared bishop. If the game ends, it will be because of that cluster. It will be because of that decision. But it's not easy, because if you go here, the white king walks in anyway. So it's a very tough position to defend. Hikaru makes a big decision with 30 seconds on the clock. Bishop f1, g4, Hikaru fights back. The pawns are slowly falling. But instead of bishop f8, apparently Hikaru had to go here. And the point is, he had to lose this pawn and go for this pawn. And that's the way he was supposed to fight back. After sustained pressure, suddenly Magnus has isolated this position and he goes here, and it's almost impossible to stop this. The only way to try to do it is to play b4, and after bishop a2 check, king e7, and bishop to g8, knight to e6, takes, bishop takes f4, bishop takes f5, bishop takes h6. Hikaru had to be a little bit aggressive, but he goes here, and now in this position, Magnus can go back to a2, but he does it this way, pawn falls, and I told you, the end game will be decided like this, and I mean, this is the Magnesian school of chess right here. Winning an endgame like this from start to finish, a sustained nastiness, a sustained pressure. And he had it the entire game. Like from this point forward, this game was going to be decided by activity in the center, that pawn, that pawn led to the restriction of the black position, the infiltration of white on the A file, the transformation into an endgame where only white is calling the shots, and then we went from there into a knights versus, knight and bishop versus two bishop endgame, and it was just pressure, 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 and black had to be perfect, and he was. For 43 moves, and on the 44th, he lost. And that's sort of how it goes when you play Magnus. Now, 
there's one guy that you're going to call on to beat Magnus in a must-win situation. It might be Hikaru. Hikaru opens game two with an offbeat Jobava London style gambit. He, he plays this in one of these like odd lines where White might lose a center pawn, but White's going to get crazy activity and it's going to challenge Magnus's theoretical knowledge. Magnus takes on e4 with the knight, and now Hikaru plays a move I've never seen in my life. Instead of taking, and then taking, which is a line I've actually played myself, queen a5, you can play queen d2, if queen c5, there's like knight e2, and there's obscure gambit lines here all over the place. Instead of that, Hikaru gets his center pawn taken, and goes here. This looks like 300 elo chess. Now, you will also notice he spent a lot of time. Spent a lot of time. He spent like 90 seconds on this. I don't know if it was a bluff. I don't know what it was. The knight went out to defend against knight c7. Now Hikaru kicked out this knight. And then he took. And then he went here. And then he took the knight trying to damage the structure. Magnus gave a check instead to try to take back. And now Hikaru played this nice idea b4. The point is, if you take this and check, I will come back, attack your queen, and then you will never take the bishop. So we have this, this, we kick out the queen, queen b3, and now we have this position. Okay, Hikaru's got a very weird position. He is up a pawn, but Magnus has dominant control of the light squares. It's unclear if white is ever going to castle. And if Magnus can get castled himself, he will put rooks here and bombard the white position and likely win the game. Hikaru plays a4, seizing more queenside space, and then he continues to make moves that do not make any progress toward castling. Very dangerous stuff. Queen c6, the knight is out, now knight d4 is possible. Magnus tries to fight back with the pawns, and Hikaru plays pawn c3. Take, take, the pawn is lost. You may ask yourself, why didn't Hikaru play something like knight to d4 here? Knight to d4 definitely looks good, but after something like queen c8, it might not be clear how to sustain the position after moves like b6 are on the way. Knight d4 is very natural, but probably Hikaru didn't like something. Because I gotta tell you, this move looks very, very natural to me. Queen d5, maybe take, take, with pressure on the pawns. I'm not sure. Clearly, he did not like something. And instead, he chucks the a-pawn, plays rook d1, and all of a sudden, black is doing very well. Black has all the benefits of his position, but he's no longer down a pawn. Bishop b2, still no castling from Hikaru. He gets the rook in the corner. Now, you may be wondering, how did Magnus get his rook trapped? Good question. Instead of b6, black had to go rook d8. The idea, if white plays knight c3 now, queen into d3, sacrificing the rook, not quite, but, you know, leaving it to hang. That's actually not a sacrifice whatsoever. That would, I mean, just queen d3 is a counteract. And then if something like rook d1 here, boom. g3, boom. King f1. That would be nice if it was mate, but you can't teleport, but just queen f3 and... So, Magnus suddenly loses the grip on the position, loses the rook. Now Hikaru threatens checkmate. Magnus plays bishop f6, and Hikaru plays queen e3. So, Hikaru still hasn't castled. He also can't castle because it's illegal. Super weird game. Extremely back and forth. Now Hikaru goes from slightly better maybe in the opening to equal to potentially worse for a couple of moves. Very chaotic game. Bishop h4 check played by Magnus trying to induce white into making another weakening move. And then he goes back here to defend his pawn. Plays rook b8 and but suddenly Hikaru's breaking out. King f2. Nothing can get into the second rank. Bishop c2 looks really good but immediately blunders this which is a fork. So we have king f2. The queen gets in closer. Rook c1, and all of a sudden, Hikaru's winning. Bishop c2, Hikaru's winning. It's completely winning here. Plays queen d2, pinning the bishop to the queen. Queen c5, check king g2, Hikaru's completely winning. Wait a minute. In this position, with 30 seconds on the clock, Hikaru had to find bishop to d4, which simultaneously hits the queen, this, and that. And the only way to play on in this position would have been rook to d8 by black. Because if take, then take. But Hikaru could win here with the move rook to b8, which is a disgusting rook sacrifice. 
which crosses the rook to the king, so the rook can't actually take the bishop. If the rook can't take the bishop, then the queen can't take the bishop because the queen would take the queen and the rook can't take the queen because of the pin on the king. And if you get rid of that, you would lose your queen. And if you do nothing, I'll take the rook and then I'll take the bishop. So black has too many things hanging at the same time. Hikaru m probably missed that considering he's a human being and he has 30 seconds on the clock. He goes here and Magnus is able to sack his queen and get just enough for it. And even here, Hikaru might have been able to play bishop takes g7 with the idea of king g7 and a fork. Or, I guess, I don't know which fork is better. And then taking the bishop. But instead of that, he goes here. And then Magnus... Magnus does something unbelievable here. Um, queen c1. And Magnus Carlsen, in this position, gives away his rook. Because the bishops create a defensive fortress. I have never seen something like this. Magnus gave up a full queen in an endgame to create an impregnable fortress. The only way for white to win this position is to somehow win one of the bishops and to use his pawns. But it's not winnable. G4 and black just moves back and forth. Bishop g6, white plays h4, black might play h5, and there's just no way in. King f4, bishop, I don't know, you, you can even, you could probably even just move back and forth. But what's one thing you should do? Play on. Hikaru goes here and offers a draw. That's wild. Now, he obviously thought this was not winnable. There is no way to walk the king in and, you know, get there. And you, you can't. You've got to rely on your pawns. But he didn't even try, which is the craziest part to me. If Hikaru was white here against, I think, any other grandmaster on the entire planet, he would have pushed his pawns. He didn't even do that, which is, like, there is no risk. I mean, Hikaru's not going to lose his queen. And I don't know, like, to a... I'm not, I'm not coaching Hikaru, that's not what I'm saying, but I am stunned he just played King G2 and offered a draw. Like, of course Magnus is not going to make a mistake, but, I mean, any pawn push would weaken Black's position, right? But, you know, may, maybe even Queen versus two bishops is, is just a draw, but I, I mean, I, I, it should be winning. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know. Again, these guys, they... they but you should be able to at least pose some problems. You've got to make the guy work. But I mean, he, he must have been so dejected or frustrated that he, do, he didn't even play on. I think only Magnus can do that to Hikaru. Only Magnus can do that to most Grandmasters. And that's two games. So they drew. Now Magnus has to win this game to put Hikaru away. Magnus plays knight f3 again. And this time, Hikaru plays the king's Indian defense. King's Indian is an opening that he has played many, many times, and by playing this, he wants to get this over with right now. Korean Zombie Max Holloway, round three. He's going to go out in a shield. Sword. He's going to go out in a sword, not a shield. Uh, we have a King's Indian defense, and Hikaru plays Knight A6. The, the Knight A6 system could sometimes lead to C5. You could also play C6. You could also play E5. Magnus castles and plays a very principled approach. Uh, a very provocative approach as well. Hikaru plays Knight G4. Targeting the bishop. The bishop goes here, trying to get something to go here. Hikaru commits a queen move instead. And Magnus plays very simple chess. He trades in the center. And he basically says, if you want to beat me in a King's Indian defense, you're going to have to do it with symmetrical pawn structure, with an open center. You're not going to be able to get some avalanche of pawns, which a King's Indian player wants. You have to beat me in this position, queen c1. I'm going to go pawn to h3, and I'm going to go trade dark squared bishops with you. Or you can kick me out. But now I have eyes on this pawn, and this is a threat, so you have to go here. And now Magnus plays a very nice idea. Pawn c5. And he basically says, Hikaru, if you want to attack me here, that's fine. I'm going to attack you on this side. Put my knight out. Target this. Now some of you may be wondering, is that a free pawn? It is. But then knight d5 targets this. If something like the knight going to e6, take, take. And the queen is going to pressure everything. Black is not going to be able to start an attack because the queen's going to have eyes on the king. That's sort of the idea. Hikaru plays c6. 
And normally giving up a bishop for a knight is not a good move. But Magnus is playing otherworldly level of positional chess right now. He just takes. Just gives up the bishop completely. Just completely gives it up. Why? Black's pawns are now split. Doubled. That square is juicy. Whatever you will do in the future, if you will get something to the d6 square, you are going to be very, very happy. And black is going to be unable to utilize any of this. The only plan black has remaining is the move f5. The typical King's Indian attacking move. Magnus knows that. He pushes Hikaru's knight in front of the f-pawn. And he plays rook d1. Again, black is in dire straits. Doubled pawns, weak c-pawn, weak d6 square, potentially targeted pawn... The only way that black can play this position is by creating an attack. Magnus knows that. You may argue he's down three minutes on the clock, so he's not exactly the most comfortable in this position. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to argue against that. But he knows that desperate times call for desperate measures. He knows that Hikaru's next few moves are going to be all of this. He knows that. He is forcing the game deliberately into that direction, just like in judo, to use his opponent's momentum against him. Hikaru plays queen e7, Magnus defends, Hikaru undevelops the knight. This is an indication of one thing and one thing only, the move f5 is coming. Magnus knows that. He knows Hikaru's back is against the wall. Hikaru would not have played a king's Indian defense if he doesn't want to go out right now. Queen c2, bring it. You want to play f5? Do it, because it's the only thing you can do. If you don't play f5, white is going to slowly, methodically improve his position, take more space, put a knight on d6, and you're going to lose. There it is. The forces have now clashed. Magnus and Hikaru are headed down in the exact same direction. Magnus takes. Why does he take? Why would he help his opponent develop a piece and attack his queen? Because what happens to these two pawns? The pawns that several moves ago Magnus damaged. He knew that this was coming. You're obviously not going to take with the rook either because there's no threat here. And the knight will very quickly route to the center and your rook doesn't play a pivotal role. So black has to take, slight spoiler, but you knew that was coming anyway. Black has to take on f5 with the pawn. Now Magnus plays the best defensive move. Best defensive move. You know what it is? A little shuffle. A little shuffle. Just slight shuffle. What's the idea? The idea is to fight back against the queen and the pawn. So for example, if black wanted to play knight f6... You bring a second rook, you put the rook on d6. That's it. It, it. It's just a matter of, I'm fighting here, and this rook would have had no role in the game, because that rook was there. I moved that rook there a little while ago. A little while ago, with a constant pressure over here. And now, very calmly, I move it back. Hikaru, come get some. Queen f7, sidestepping, bringing my second rook. Hikaru still, obviously, mobilizing. Magnus reroutes the knight. He's going to put the knight in front of the g-file and pressure that pawn and that pawn and maybe go there in the future to take something. Knight to g3. The knight doesn't need to go there. It's got no future on any of these squares. So let's bring it here. Bishop b6, knight g3. At some point, Hikaru's going to have to jump forward. King h8. He unpins himself, but it's the wrong move. Apparently, it's the wrong move. Knight h4. This is a fork, but then knight g6 check. So rook f8, safeguarding the pawn. And look at Mac, just very, look, just very calm. One move at a time, one move at a time. Literally, side, sliding the rook over, bringing the second rook. Rerouting the knight, one move at a time. Rerouting that knight to pressure f5 and f4 knight g6 check teaming up with the queen. Black goes here to defend. The bishop slides out of the way to reroute to the c3 square and maybe that diagonal just in the future with pressure on this. Here comes f4. Magnus has been waiting for this move to arrive for a long time. He knew Hikaru was going to attack him the whole game. Now he gets to g6. Hikaru is ready to sacrifice the rook on f8. You sacrifice the rook on f8. Black immediately counters. Magnus just brings both knights there. That's why he did all of that. Knight h4, knight h4. Now the knights are knocking on the door. 
Multiple pieces will be stripped from the attack. Hikaru moves the bishop back. Magnus picks up the rook. Hikaru takes back. And now the best move of the game, shutting it down absolutely, totally, completely, pawn to g4. That's it. If these pawns can't break loose and open the position, black's not getting any attack. Black is not getting in here. You can take en passant, but keep in mind that when you do that, you activate Magnus's bishop, and then you activate the g file. You activate the open g file. Hikaru plays bishop a2. Magnus centralizes his queen to now start targeting Hikaru. The king is under brutal attack. The knight goes to the middle. The rook opens up and goes to f3 and g3 potentially. Knight f6 check. Another piece has been removed from the attack. The queen takes the rook. But queen e7 check. Queen d6 check. Queen d7 check. And in this position, Hikaru resigned because the only place the king can go, you are running into a knight check and your queen is lost. And Hikaru beat... Yeah. Magnus beat Hikaru two and a half out of three games today. Dominant performance in the first game, winning in pure Magnesian style, a positional squeeze from start to finish, utilizing one advanced pawn and a slight misconfiguration of the black army to slowly, methodically, for 40 moves, turn the screw until it couldn't go anymore and beating Hikaru in, an opus in a minor piece endgame. In the third game, obviously, desperate times call for desperate measures. It was a King's Indian defense. Magnus picked apart the black position effortlessly, anticipating the attack, shutting it down completely, and attacking on his own on the G file. Black tried to attack. The momentum was brutally used against him. And that second game, creating one of the most obscure defensive cocoons I've ever seen in my life, Today, Magnus was on another level, and I told you in the beginning of this recap, he gave an interview after where they asked him about his rivals. And paraphrasing, Magnus basically said, in the top tier of players in the world, it's Magnus, and there are no rivals. And then he said, Hikaru is basically as close of a rival to him as possible. And... That's a pretty cold thing to say. You know, I, it's one thing as us spectators. I'm a spectator more than... I'm, I'm an enjoyer of chess. I relay it to you and you enjoy it a lot because I'm at a strong enough level where I can break down the moves by the best players in the world for you to understand and why they're relevant, why the players are relevant, their personalities, the drama of the, of the chess world and all that. That's why, you know, that's, I, I am that uh, connection to you and the, uh, for you in the chess world. Um, here's my question. Is it better to just have one dominant guy at the top of chess and completely throw out all other candidates as potential rivals? Or would you prefer that we had a degree of uncertainty every time Magnus and Hikaru played each other? Or Magnus and anybody, but if there's one man on the planet in most formats that you think could get a game off Magnus at any given moment at, right now, it's, it's, it's Hikaru. In classical chess, 90-minute chess, 3-hour, 4-hour chess... I don't know. It might be Hikaru. It might be Fabiano Caruana. I'm not exactly sure. It could be Ding Liren, although he's not playing a lot of tournaments. I prefer that when Magnus competes, it is not certain he's going to win everything. Because what are we even selling to anybody if Magnus is going to win every single event? And it's a foregone conclusion. Why are we even watching? What are we watching for? Just to see him win another thing? Is that as interesting as him not winning? I don't know. I'm posing that question to you. It's like when the Golden State Warriors got Kevin Durant. Those of you that don't watch basketball, just bear with me. It's like the best team in the league got the best player in the league, basically. Second best player in the league. Uh, and got even better. And then, yes, they won every single year, except when he got injured. Um, and then, you know, Charles Barkley said that we just had to sit around for a year and pretend that they were not going to win. I prefer to have a magnus Hikaru rivalry. Because Magnus doesn't have a rival in anything else. There's no other person that you could basically say, that guy's going to beat Magnus in a head-to-head -head match. Hikaru is also the most popular chess player professionally in the world. Tied with Magnus, however you want to, with all the followers and everything. So that's, that, those are my thoughts. And uh, today, Magnus came to play. And not only did he come to play, he also afterwards said that he doesn't consider the fact that he has any rivals. <laughs> so... <laughs>
Wow. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. We need some more trash talking in chess. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.